Good afternoon and welcome to our second project show for today. The team from Tallinn University of Technology will tell you about two smart lunar clothing concepts that are meant to improve the life of astronauts inside the moon habitat. If you would like to learn more about the project, please use our YouTube chat to submit your questions to the team and the students will be happy to address them after their presentation. Thank you very much for joining us today and I am happy to give the word to the team. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our project show. My name is Harm. I am the project lead of Team 12 Smart Lunar Clothing, and today I will be presenting with Robert. So for the past uh, year, we have been working on smart integrated wearable technology for astronauts inside the moon base. Our team consists of seven students from four different countries, and we all study design and technology futures at Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. Uh, for the past two semesters, we've been researching the topic of smart clothing on a moon base. Have you ever considered what it would be like to live on the moon? Um, what things would be different and what kind of challenges come up in daily life? Maybe you know very well how challenging it can be, or maybe you never gave it much thought. And that was definitely the case for us when we started out. None of us knew much about space and definitely not about daily life on a hypothetical moon base. So when we started, we felt a little bit upside down. Our project started with the very open question, how can we improve the daily life of astronauts on the moon using smart clothing? We started out as two teams, uh, and we both started with researching this topic, finding a problem, uh, finding something that we could solve, and developing a concept for that. So of course, during our research, we quickly found out that living on the moon is a very serious challenge. You're dealing with low gravity, which is not good for your body, very limited amounts of water, and huge amounts of radiation. For that reason, the base will most likely be underground, which means the astronauts are also dealing with an artificial day and night cycle. And on top of that, they're living in isolation, uh, far away from Earth and from their loved ones. And also besides those personal impacts on the astronauts, we also have to consider that the logistic systems that were used on Earth don't work in the same way either. Everything that's necessary for a mission needs to come up and be brought up by rocket from Earth, and waste disposal is a serious challenge as well. So while we were researching uh, what life would be like on the moon, these are the two areas that caught our attention. The logistics of living on a moon base and the personal health of the astronauts. And through framing our problems through smart clothing, we arrived at these two specific topics, clothing management and monitoring of vital signs. So clothing management or clothing waste is maybe not the first thing you would think of when you're considering the challenges of living in space, but it's definitely something tricky. Uh, there are currently no good feasible ways to wash clothing in space due to the low gravity or even zero gravity on the International Space Station and the scarcity of water. That means that clothes are worn for a couple of days after which they're discarded. Uh, on the International Space Station, they are simply shot into space to burn up, but that will not be as, uh, as easy on the moon. And besides that, it's a very wasteful process resulting in about 200 kilos of clothing per person every year. And as we discussed before, there are a bunch of different factors in space that have a negative effect on your health. Uh, to combat this as much as possible, astronauts require a large amount of high quality sleep and exercise to stay fit. But we also know from studies on the International Space Station that this is a serious challenge and astronauts often don't meet those goals. So for long-term missions, we will need to make sure that astronauts stay fit and healthy while also making sure that we can intervene as fast as possible when we see negative trends. To do this, we gather and analyze data under sleep and exercise. This great data is great for personal use, but it can also be pulled together and analyzed to study effects of long-term exposure to low gravity on the human body. But the monitoring process can be very unpleasant for astronauts. It usually involves a bunch of machines that need to be connected to their bodies, which can result in feeling like a guinea pig. And of course, this is something we want to avoid, especially for long-term missions. After the research phase of our project, we were left with what seemed to be some interesting problems that could be encountered on the moon base. And the next step was, of course, to transform these problems into new opportunities for exciting innovations. With this, we developed two concepts, and Robert will now present to you the first one, the modular shirt. Oh, hello, I'm Robert. Um, in our normal daily lives, we just wash our clothes when they're dirty. And what dirty means is personal and cultural. Some people will wear something once before washing it and others might air it out and wear it again. And of course, it also depends on what you did while wearing these clothes. 
if you went to the gym or you were working in the garden, your clothes probably need a wash before you want to wear them again. But in a clinical environment like the moon base, the only solution, the only source of dirtiness is perspiration. And here we can make an important distinction between apocrine glands and, and the eccrine glands. While well, eccrine glands only let out carbohydrates, apocrine glands also let out proteins. This combination causes the typical smell that warns us our clothes are dirty. But when we decide to dispose, dispose of a t-shirt based on this sign, the shirt is actually only 25% dirty. Based on this, we developed a modular shirt with removable sleeves and armpits. We also used a high-tech merino wool blend that increases odor resistance and breathability, which allows the shirt to be aired out between uses without needing to be washed. If a regular t-shirt can be worn for four consecutive days on the ISS, our predictions are that a merino wool shirt could be worn for at least a week. If you combine this with the modular sleeves and allowing the shirt to be aired out between uses, we can anticipate the total wearing time of 28 days, while only the sleeves will need to be cleaned or replaced. When considering that one shirt is supposed to last for four days of usage, it would mean that eight shirts alone is needed to, for having a supply for one month. This would mean that 1.2 kilograms of weight is spent already on one type of shirt. And if we imagine the daily life, then there's more shirts that are needed. But introducing modularity would help to reduce this weight down by 70% through using a base shirt and changeable sleeves. The base shirts get 30 years slower than the sleeves. It helps to reduce the usage down to two base shirts per month with the addition of four pairs of sleeves, ending in total weight of 350 grams per one month. And now uh, Harm will talk about the second concept called MICA. Yes. So our second concept, MICA, is a smart base layer undershirt with integrated sensors, which can automatically monitor astronauts and synchronize the data to a personal health dashboard. This data can be reviewed to judge health, performance, sleep quality, and keep track of workouts. Because the system is integrated in the astronauts' daily wear, they won't have to give the monitoring process a second thought. In this way, they can completely focus on their work while knowing the data will be available for them when necessary. MICA is designed to be comfortably worn for long periods of time. The sensors are integrated in the chest area, and they are powered by a small battery tucked into a pocket at the shoulder. The shirt can automatically start recording data when worn, and it can also be set to monitor during specific periods like exercise and sleep. So let's take a look at the daily life of an astronaut. During any given day, they will spend time working on research or setting up the base. They will exercise for a couple of hours, and of course, they will spend time socializing, eating, and sleeping. So the way MICA fits in there is for most of the day, it can just be used to track the basics, like general movement or resting heartbeat, which is uh, an important metric for research in low gravity environments. During a workout, uh, the astronaut can receive a personalized workout routine, and MICA will work together with the gym equipment to collect data on the workout, like exercise types, duration, and heart rate. This data will then be used to generate better exercise routines, which will help the astronauts stay healthy. During the night, MICA can be used to collect data on sleep, like sleep cycles and movement. In the morning, astronauts can review their sleep duration and quality and adjust their schedules to allow for more sleep if necessary. These solutions will help the astronauts to stay fit and healthy and keep an eye on their data over a longer period of time. Together with our partner Protex here in Tallinn, uh, we also develop prototypes for both concepts. The modular shirt shows off its removable sleeves, while MICA has real integrated sensors to showcase how the shirt works. Of course, we would have loved to showcase these on the exhibition, but sometimes things work out a bit different than planned. And as you could already see probably in the pictures, these prototypes have a pretty similar form factor. The concepts have been developed by both teams uh, independently, uh, but they are definitely compatible and could be turned into one comprehensive smart undershirt in the future as well. So now we will take a look at how these uh, solutions would apply back to Earth with Robert. So, yeah. While these concepts have been developed specifically for the moon base, of course, we also see different opportunities to apply these innovations to ourselves, so back on Earth. As we mentioned before, 
when we decide our clothes are dirty and need to be washed is very personal and subjective. This leads us to the question of when we can objectively determine it's time to be washed. We see more and more smart materials emerge on the market that don't require as much washing as traditional materials, which is great for our water consumption. And at the same time, this will extend the lifespan of the clothes and allows us to enjoy them actually longer. Maybe in combination with modular design, we could push this even further. And wearable technology has been very rapidly developing market over the past years. But while smartwatches, bands and rings are becoming more popular, we also see a lot of opportunities for integrated sensors in clothing. One of these would be in the healthcare system where ease of use and seamless integration might be extra important. So while designing for a hypothetical moon base over this past year, we actually learned a lot of lot about real life situations that affect us all. And after today's presentation, I hope you learned something new as well. Thank you very much for your attention and we would love to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for your very nice presentation. And uh, indeed, I see that we have some questions in our YouTube chat. Thank you very, every, very much everyone for submitting them. Um, so let's have um, I have someone is writing in the chat that uh, the astronauts already monitor the vital during vital signs during the training, like in the ISS. So, how would you project um, uh, support any advantage to the already developed systems? So, uh, one of the uh, big improvements that we are aiming for, uh, based on the current situations, is that we want to hide the monitoring process uh, in the clothing that the astronauts would be wearing already anyways. So this would be a shirt that is something that you can just put on underneath your normal clothes, or it could even be worn solo. And all of the monitoring equipment is already integrated, which means that you never have to give it a second thought. One of the pieces of feedback that we got during the development was that the um, monitoring process can feel very intrusive, especially over a longer period of time because there's always this equipment that you have to wear or this, this sort of visibility of the monitoring process. And it, it feels a bit like someone is watching you. It, it's uh, messing with your privacy. And this way, it's uh, something that is autonomous and can just fade into the background and you never have to think about it. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, somebody is asking, um, were you guys able to make build prototypes of the clothes? Yes, uh, we developed prototypes for both. Uh, so as you could see in the picture in the slide, we have a prototype for the modular shirt with actual removable sleeves. And um, for the smart base undershirt, we have a prototype with a couple of, uh, I have to say simpler sensors, prototyping sensors, but the basic functionality is there and we can actually uh, turn it on, run it, put code on it and extract some data from it, which, is something we would, of course, have loved to showcase on the exhibition. That was the original plan, uh, but for now, it will have to be through slides. Indeed, it's a pity that we were not able to have the exhibition and to be able to see the prototypes that you have already managed to create. And uh, somebody is also asking, what was the biggest challenge for you during this year, apart from the situation with the virus? Maybe that's a fun one for Robert to answer. Mm. Definitely, maybe the biggest challenge was the start of the project or uh, as we are design students with no uh, back knowledge about moon in any in any given way, then just uh, starting to learn about uh, what the moon habitat is, uh, what's the difference between ISS and the moon habitat, uh, and then also managing your team uh, at the same time to produce uh, something what we have done so far. Yes, and uh, the, also the research question that we started with uh, on purpose was kept very, very open. Um, so we were basically told to do something with smart clothing on the moon base with no further details. So it was not only finding the solution, it was also finding the problem to solve first, which is, yeah, like Robert said, it's very interesting when you have no concept about what living on the moon looks like. 
Thank you very much. It was indeed really great to have your team as part of the Igluna 2020 this year. And I see we have some questions from the audience that are, are related to some other teams from Igluna this year. So somebody is asking, uh, have you thought about combining your concept with the idea from the focus team from Milano? They had an idea of a UVC cleaning device. So have you thought about this idea to clean the clothes with the UV radiation? I think that's uh, mostly Robert's uh, topic, but I think you considered that, didn't you, UV cleaning? Uh, a little bit, but uh, to be honest, I don't actually remember why we ditched it. Uh, it was so early in the process, um, but we wanted to do it independently in the beginning, and uh, and it stayed like that, uh, sadly, maybe. <laughs> I think, yeah, now that uh, at this point where we have the prototypes and we actually know what it looks like and how it works, uh, now it would definitely be interesting to look at what other teams have and maybe keep developing. Thank you very much. I see somebody is asking in our YouTube chat, is it safe for the people to wear those electronics on the clothes? Uh, yes, it uh, should be pretty safe. All of the... Um, uh, all of the electronics themselves are insulated from both sides, so they're really integrated in the clothing and they can be reached. And everything is running on such a low voltage that uh, there shouldn't be any risk for health, even if there would be like something that would be exposed through damage. Thank you very much. Still on the topic of the sensors inside the T-shirt, um, the question is, is it waterproof? Yes, it actually is. It's uh, it's almost surprising but um, the only thing that uh, needs to be taken out to clean is the battery and um, on the other hand uh, the cleaning technique that we were mostly looking at that we saw as the one possibility that might work on the moon so far is a uh, co2 based dry cleaning process if i'm not mistaken but i think that was the case robert is nodding so yes uh, and that um, using that is actually safe for the electronics because it's a non-conductive liquid and gas, uh, which means that even with the battery inside, it would be possible to clean the shirt. Thank you. I see that indeed you have made a lot of thoughts behind, behind your concepts. I have another question from the audience. Um, again, for the sensors, will it be affected by the radiation? Have you thought about this? That's something we haven't researched. That's a very good question. OK, I see. Um, so then let's go to another question. What is the exact composition of your t-shirts? Uh, so both t-shirts make use of merino wool because it's a very good odor resistant material that uh, can be worn for a longer period of time and can be aired out very well. Uh, and it doesn't really hold on to uh, those particles that create the smell over time as much as, for example, cotton. Uh, it's also very durable. And then uh, for the modular shirt, we have some other um, slightly maybe more technical materials. There's some uh, jersey blend in there for stretchability. There's some mesh for airing out. Um, but uh, together with our partner Protex, we picked the materials for both shirts that would ensure the optimum uh, quality, wearing time, and comfort. Thank you very much. I think the next question is kind of related to it. Uh, somebody is asking, do you think your fiber can be reused, for example, uh, as a substrate for plant cultivation, like the fiber mentioned in uh, the presentation from the Vigil team? Hmm. Robert, is that something you would know something about? Yeah, well, natural fibers are known to be, uh, to be uh, possible to be reused. Uh, and this is something that we have considered as well uh, as our concept, uh, personally. Uh, there was a plan that we won't wash the clothes, but we will be able to send those clothes back to, on, to Earth. And I think this, if we take this part out of the concept and change it into that, how we can use those clothes uh, still on the moon, then this is something uh, that we could look into later as well. Thank you very much. Um, I have some further questions. I think you mentioned already when you were answering the question about the most challenging aspect, you mentioned that actually to come up with the idea was one of the most challenging aspects. Could you remind us like how exactly this idea came from? 
so to come to the actual um, sort of problem that we wanted to solve was uh, an individual process for both of the teams. Uh, so at the start of the project, we split up the seven people in four and three, and we were both doing our research independently. And through that research, also looking for uh, areas of opportunity where we could work. So I can say for uh, our half of the team, um, we started first focusing a lot on sleep because we noticed that um, the effects of sleep would have a very big effect on uh, the mood of the astronauts and the overall health. And then from focusing more on sleep, we sort of came back to uh, focusing more on monitoring and the facilitation of sleep. And then we realized that with the same technology, we could also focus on um, sport and well-being and then move to overall daily monitoring. And that's sort of how we ended up in that research question. And from there, we came with this design. Thank you very much. And uh, I have the last question for now that I see in the chat. What is the state of art of similar technologies? At least for the um, monitoring, I think the, um, actually some of the, the best solutions that are out there are things you can already buy, like uh, sort of the higher quality sports watches, uh, sports bands, something like Apple Watch. Um, and something that we are anticipating to happen in the next maybe 10, 20 years is that we will move from these separate devices to things that are so readily available and so easy to integrate in our clothing that uh, we might actually be using these things before it ever reaches astronauts, simply because it will be so easily commercially available that uh, it almost doesn't make sense not to do it. And it will be so much easier to put on a shirt when you go to the gym that's already tracking everything for you and does it at such a high quality that you can be drawing your own conclusions from it or maybe even getting recommendations to work out better. Thank you very much for your answer. Indeed, this is a very relevant topic that you are addressing in your project, both so space applications, but as you mentioned also already now in the daily life, it's a very uh, relevant topic. Um, I do not see any further questions from the chat, but we still have quite some time. So it's your chance maybe if you would like to uh, say a few words more about the project, uh, then you can have a few minutes. Oh, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good question. Robert, is there anything you would like to add about this? Um, it's been, it's been quite the journey from since 1st of September when we started the project. Uh, uh, I'm, I feel sad as well that we couldn't be doing it in Switzerland at the moment, but times are how they are, um, but I think we managed to pull it through, uh, mainly thanks to our team lead Harm, uh, who did an excellent job uh, leading all this, so applause for him. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Indeed, I see one more question now, if you would like to address this too, is there a winter version of your clothes? <laughs> <laughs> We're in Estonia, so I think we should have it, but <laughs> so far, no. They're uh, specifically designed for climate-controlled, reasonable 23-degree moon bases so far. But maybe in the future. I see. Thank you very much. Then um, I see that there are no further questions from the chat. Thank you so much. It was a very nice discussion with you. Um, with that, I would like to conclude this session. Thank you very much, team, for the presentation. And thank you, everyone, for watching us. Um, there will be a talk from our guest from ESA from AX Spaceship later today, so make sure not to miss it. Uh, thanks again, and have a nice day. Goodbye.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to another session of Spe Space Spare Talks of our Iglunas 2020 virtual field campaign. I am Jesus Manuel Muñoz Tejeda. I'm a Space Technology Advisor since the engineer for the Igluna project. And today I have with me two very special guests. Uh, we have Timon Silt and Sebastian Loren from the European Space Agency. Uh, especially, they are working in the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, Germany and they have prepared a very nice presentation showing us what is the technology that is currently being developed there and how they came into the European Space Agency and some teams are recommendations for the people that actually wants to join uh, for the next years with them. So Timon, uh, Sebastian, thank you very much for being with us today and if you are ready with your presentation you are free to go. Thank you very much for, for your introduction, Jesus. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. And there we go. Uh, so hello, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to this presentation. So as mentioned, I'm here today with Sebastian uh, to present to you Spaceship EAC, uh, which is our team at the European Space Agency. Uh, so to do so, first of all, I'm going to present you the Spaceship uh, EAC initiative, so the team itself, and give you a quick overview of what we do. Uh, and then Sebastian is going to talk a bit more in detail about his personal experience with us as an intern. And I am then going to do the same thing uh, about myself as a trainee. Uh, after a short conclusion, we're then going to open the floor to your questions. So please feel free to ask them in the chat. Uh, so starting about Spaceship EAC then, um, perhaps you've never heard of us or so heard only a very little. So I'd like to start answering some basic questions about us. So who we are, uh, where we do our activities, uh, why we exist as a team in the first place, and what we do in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, so starting with where, uh, we're based at the European Astronaut Center, so EAC, uh, which is an ESA site uh, located in Cologne, Germany. Uh, we are actually on the campus of uh, the DLR, so the German Space Agency. And as far as ESA site goes, uh, we're actually a, quite a small one. We have around 100 people here. Uh, and our main activity is to take care of the European astronauts, as the, main, uh, as the name may suggest, and we are the home of the European Astronaut Corps. Uh, so those activities are divided into three main pillars uh, that you can see here. Uh, first of all, training. Uh, so we have the responsibility of selecting and training all ESA astronauts. Um, in that case here on this picture, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see Matthias Maurer uh, doing some training uh, in the neutral buoyancy facility, a dedica dedicated facility that we have here uh, at EAC. Uh, we also take care of the health of our astronauts. We have a medical team uh, dedicated to uh, monitoring the health of our astronauts before, during and after each flight. Um, and here to illustrate that, you can see Alexander Gerst doing some uh, medical uh, checkup uh, actually uh, at DLR since we collaborate a lot with them on this subject. Uh, and finally, uh, we also do the operations uh, or we take uh, care of a lot of the operations of our astronaut missions, uh, as well as the operation of the hardware, uh, such as the Columbus module on the ISS. Uh, to illustrate that, here you can see uh, one of our Eurocoms, which we like to call our voices uh, or the voice of Europe in space. Uh, and uh, so all the communications from Europe that go uh, to our astronauts about the ISS uh, go through us at EAC through our Eurocoms. Uh, so obviously nowadays we're very much focused on the ISS program, but this is to be changed in the near future. Uh, since, as you may have understood by now, uh, the next step for human exploration will definitely be the moon, uh, with first of all the lunar orbit with the gateway program, and then uh, presence on the surface, uh, leading hopefully to a permanent lunar base as uh, envisioned by ESA with its moon village concept. So obviously ESA in general and EAC specifically uh, is preparing for that future already. Uh, and to do so, uh, the first uh, activity from EAC is planning and building the uh, Luna facility. Uh, this is a new building that will be built right next to the European Astronaut Center, uh, and that will be uh, dedicated to replicate the conditions that you would meet on the lunar surface, uh, both for training our astronauts and also to test our systems uh, and, uh, and equipment. Uh, 
So this is uh, on the progress and should be available in the coming years. Uh, and then there is Spaceship EAC, which is also part of this effort of preparation for lunar exploration. We are part of a program called EXPERT, so Exploration, Preparation, Research and Technologies at ESA. And here are our three main missions. First of all, uh, well, our first mission is to enhance, uh, which means enhance EAC. Uh, so uh, use uh, our uh, creativity, our uh, innovation, uh, to develop some hardware or software that can actually be used nowadays for today's operation uh, of EAC, uh, since we're very much part of that center. Uh, the second one is Enable, uh, which is a bit more research focused. So trying to come up with new ideas, new technologies, uh, do some research on them and demonstrate their usability in lunar exploration scenarios. On that aspect, we're actually very close to what uh, uh, the students uh, for IGLUNA have been doing, uh, which is to uh, show new ways uh, to approach uh, human exploration of the moon. So there are a lot of parallels there already between Spaceship and IGLUNA. Our third mission is to inspire, uh, so to uh, bring spaceflight and human spaceflight closer to the general public through things like I am doing right now, uh, so through presentations, uh, but also by publishing uh, our results in scientific papers. And for Spaceship, we also see ourselves as an, as an open door uh, to uh, students and young professionals to get the first experience in the, in the human space flight sector. Uh, so who are we then? Uh, we're a team, as you can see, of young people, uh, as is obvious on the picture on the left. Uh, this is a picture from a couple of years back. Uh, and uh, we are mostly uh, built around students. So currently we have uh, one ESA astronaut. There's always an ESA astronaut assigned to us. Currently it is Matthias Maurer. Uh, one ESA staff member that is uh, the main project, uh, the main team leader uh, with, and taking part of the, of, the man of the main management processes of Spaceship. Uh, then one research fellow and two national trainees, including myself, uh, also part of the uh, management team of Spaceship. Uh, on one side and on the other side uh, doing some technical work as well. And finally, the students, uh, 12 at the moment, uh, who are doing their internships with us for durations between three months and, one, and an in entire year, uh, and working on their side on more uh, technical and research focused projects. Uh, you can see that at the moment we're less than 20 people, usually we're in a bit more. In this picture there are 30. Uh, so this means uh, that we will definitely be recruiting uh, new uh, young motivated people in, people in the new future. So if you're interested in uh, joining us, uh, please uh, keep an eye on this space. There will be opportunities that I'm going to address a bit later. Beyond our team, uh, we're also part of a broader network that we can uh, use uh, to our advantage. Uh, obviously, first of all, with other ESA sites, uh, we collaborated a lot with EXAT, ESOC and DESTEC in the past and present. Uh, so ESTEC, for example, have a lot of dedicated facilities for uh, experimental work and testing. Uh, so if we need to do uh, some, some specific analyses, we can, we can uh, usually contact them. Uh, we, ho we host a lot of students. So we obviously uh, work a lot with academia and other research centers. DLR, of course, since we, we share their campus and uh, universities like, for instance, example, EGM, an engineering school in France uh, that sends us students on a very regular basis. And finally, we also work with companies. Uh, that it is also one of ESA's mission is to involve the private sector into, into space. And this is no different for us. So we collaborate with companies. For instance, we collaborated with Air Liquid on uh, ways of extracting oxygen from lunar, uh, from lunar materials and purify it. Um, we're also not alone as spaceships. Um, we were the first spaceship created at EAC in 2012, focused on human exploration of the moon. Uh, but uh, seeing the success of that uh, second spaceship has been created in 2018 at EXAT, uh, more oriented toward uh, robotic systems and Mars. And finally, a third one will be created in 2021 uh, uh, in France uh, under the wing of the CNES, so the French uh, Space Agency. So what do we actually do uh, with our time? So our main activities are split into those four categories. Uh, the main technical work and research work is done in the student projects. Uh, each of our, our students 
uh, has one specific uh, project assigned to him uh, that he has to lead, uh, which more often than not is associated to his master's thesis, but it could also be a bachelor thesis or another uh, research work. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also have a lot of, uh, or we also try to do some group projects where we take different students from different backgrounds uh, and, and put them together into teams that we then can use to our advantage to generate uh, innovative ideas to take part, for instance, in innovation challenges uh, or competitions. EAC, EAC activities also is a very important component of our work. Since we are an integral part of EAC, we obviously chip in into projects uh, that, uh, uh, that go over the, the entire center. Uh, and uh, finally, outreach, as already mentioned, this is what we're doing uh, right now, trying to get ourselves known and get uh, the, the, the things that we discover and that we explore out there. Looking at the technical side, uh, our projects are uh, divided into six main categories that you can see here. Uh, so starting with energy, looking into ways to power uh, infrastructure uh, on the moon. Uh, disruptive technologies, looking at uh, new technologies, not necessarily from the space uh, sector uh, and apply them to the future of lunar exploration. Space resources, looking at how we could use resources on the moon uh, to enhance our capabilities there further, uh, for instance, by uh, extracting uh, oxygen or other materials. Of Earth Living, very much focused on biology and biochemistry, uh, looking at how we can uh, maintain life on the moon and how we can use life to our advantage with, for instance, plant-based technologies. Robotics is, of course, a very important part of human exp exploration, and we're uh, looking into aspects such as human and robotic interactions. And finally, advanced manufacturing, uh, where we seek ways to use manufacturing techniques uh, from the present, but also from the future, uh, to uh, build components and structures on the moon, uh, and also to repair uh, what we may already have there. The, the thing here to notice is that those topical areas are actually very close to the areas from uh, Igluna. And I think that most, if not all, of the projects presented by the students this week would fit into one or more of those categories. This again shows uh, a strong parallel between Spaceship EAC uh, and uh, the Igluna initiative. And uh, we're definitely in the, same in the same boat and working towards uh, uh, one objective uh, uh, given by, by ESA, which is exploration of the moon. Uh, what I would now uh, like to do is to uh, go through those uh, topical areas one by one and give you a single example of a project that we did there. Uh, I could talk about 20 minutes about, on each of those projects, but I'll try to keep it a bit short just to give you a flavor and an overview of what we're actually doing. Starting off with energy then, uh, in the past uh, we've been working quite a lot with the fuel cell system, hydrogen fuel cell systems, and had students looking into that in order to gather actual uh, hands-on experience on how those systems work, as well as uh, some more theoretical uh, background and, and modeling tasks to improve those systems. Uh, this is aiming at uh, integrating this technology into what we call the standalone power system, which is a fully integrated power system to be tested and used in Luna. Disruptive technologies, a key aspect of this uh, topic has been augmented and virtual reality. Uh, and ways of using those. So an example is that we have developed an application, a VR application for astronaut training. You can see here Matthias Maurer doing some pre-familiarization using this technology. And that is a very good example of activities that we do for EAC today and in very close collaboration with some people at EAC uh, to come up with solutions to improve uh, the current uh, the current different uh, projects going on at EAC, such as astronaut training. Going back into much more uh, research-focused territory now with space resources, a uh, very interesting uh, topic we have going on at the moment is using ionic liquids for oxygen ex extraction. Uh, so use a new type of chemicals to extract oxygen uh, from, uh, from lunar regolith. Uh, in that case, uh, we have a chemistry student working on that, and that shows 
uh, that uh, we have a whole variety of background of people working with us, not only people from aerospace background, but also chemists. And uh, as you have seen previously also, for instance, computer scientists and, uh, and a whole lot of different domains. Offward living, uh, we've been uh, addressing the important challenge of radiation shielding and how we can protect uh, the astronauts uh, on the moon. Uh, in that case, by using regolith. And we did a study on, uh, in, in, on investigating uh, the actual effectiveness of regolith in shielding astronauts from radiations. Uh, this is, again, more theoretical work, research work, uh, supported by some simulation work uh, that we did actually uh, publish quite recently in a scientific paper. Uh, robotics, here's an example of a, robo uh, of a robot uh, that we built uh, called Marvin, which is a system uh, to test both teleoperations and human and robotic interactions uh, that was developed by Spaceship EAC and uh, in order to first gain hands-on experience with those technologies, build the infrastructure around it uh, and prepare for further testing at the Luna facility. And then finally, uh, advanced manufacturing. Uh, uh, ongoing topic there is additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing, uh, where we try uh, to uh, 3D print some complex geometries uh, using uh, lunar material or lunar regolith. Uh, in that case, on the right hand side, you can see a commercial 3D printer that we, we use uh, with, one, uh, with a filament that we built ourselves uh, for that effect. Uh, which allows to uh, achieve quite high concentrations actually of regolith in, in the finished component. Um, as a side note, uh, when we're not using those 3D printers uh, for our research, we give access to them to the rest of EAC uh, for, uh, to manufacture uh, other components, for example, hardware for uh, training. So uh, that's a bit of an overview of uh, what uh, we do at Spaceship. Uh, I'm now uh, going to leave the floor uh, to Sebastian, who's going to get a bit more into detail uh, on the uh, on his own experience here at Spaceship uh, during that he gathered during his internship. Great, thank you very much, Timon. Also, a uh, warm welcome from my side. Uh, I'm honored to be here today and to uh, be able to represent all of the interns of uh, the team of Spaceship EAC. It would, of course, be uh, great if we could all be here. Uh, but in this case, you get just myself, uh, and I will tell you something about um, the general life as an intern at Spaceship EAC. So uh, to quickly introduce myself, my name is uh, Sebastian. I am from Austria, which is evident by my accent, but also by the flag right next to where it says nationality. Uh, I have been an intern ever since uh, February of this year. I'm in a six-month um, internship, which means that I'm actually currently in my last uh, month of the internship. And I've listed some of the projects that I've actually been working on um, for you right here. Um, you shall be forgiven if you don't know them. Uh, they are not as well known as uh, you know, Project Apollo or the uh, Space Shuttle program. Uh, but that's why I will uh, uh, talk about them uh, a little bit later. Uh, my background is in computer science mostly, but also a bit of aviation and a bit of astronomy. And because that's very complicated and odd, I thought uh, I might take a bit of a closer look at how exactly I ended up at the European Space Agency. Now, in uh, 2015, I actually gra uh, graduated from a school, uh, basically an engineering school. It, I don't think it really exists, the, the type uh, anywhere outside of Austria. Um, but it enables you to go to a university. But uh, at the same time, it actually uh, also really focuses on the field uh, that you choose to, to study. In my case, that was computer science. So afterwards, when I uh, graduated, I already had a pretty good overview and quite good knowledge of computer science. But I thought, you know what? I want to study something different. And I decided to go into astronomy and study that in Vienna for a while, right after my military service, which is uh, uh, mandatory in Austria. And uh, yeah, I started uh, studying astronomy. And in parallel, uh, what I did was I started working as a uh, programmer because it's always good to reincorporate some of the degrees that you have. Uh, and I did that combination for quite a while until I actually got the opportunity to move to Switzerland and to start training as uh, an airline pilot for a uh, major Swiss airline, which is called Swiss. Now, even though uh, that mixed up my plans quite a bit and I had never really planned uh, 
to do that, to, to do pilot training, I thought, you know what, let's not pass up on the opportunity because that's one of those, you know, one in a lifetime chances. And it took me two years uh, to do that, uh, but it was really interesting and varied. Uh, so I, I, we learned a lot about uh, not just flying the airplane, but also learning about how it works and, um, you know, uh, an introduction to aerodynamics and engineering. Um, which previously I'd never uh, gotten before, and then I was also focusing a lot of uh, a lot uh, in uh, the soft skills, you know, for example, managing priorities and teamwork and all that. Um, and after completing pilot school in late 2019, there was supposed to be some sort of uh, waiting period and you know some time until I could actually start flying the big passenger uh, jets. And I decided uh, it was I was going to continue studying art until then. And that is actually what led me to apply to uh, to the European Space Agency and to get the internship at Spaceship. Now, as a quick disclaimer, uh, my CV is very odd. Uh, most of my colleagues don't have it, uh, you know, have a regular looking CV. I guess they already have their bachelor's degree and they are now usually in their last years of uh, of the master's degree. And most of them are actually writing the thesis here at Spaceship EAC. But for now, enough about myself. Uh, let's look into what does an internship generally look like for everyone, regardless of your background. Well, uh, work is split into uh, basically a couple of different areas. Uh, the first one is your main project, which is usually the focus of your work. Um, it has a lot to do with your own area of expertise, and it's actually also your your own. You know, you you can you have lots of freedom and where you want to take it and, and what you want to do with it. Um, but you're still always open to discuss it with the trainees, with ESA staff, with everyone you, uh, you, you want to talk to if you're not sure where to take it. And uh, because every intern actually has their own project, and we have, and because we have a huge vari variety of skill sets available, uh, oftentimes you will actually ask other people for help in your project. And others will also ask you for your help every now and then because you know something that they don't or the other way around. And that is definitely a, a huge advantage of, of Spaceship is the uh, collaboration between interns. Um, and then additionally, every now and then what you get is um, our opportunities to work in sort of an additional group project. Those are, of course, by design, uh, very cooperative and collaborative, and they're always a lot of fun. And yeah, those are the general areas. And I will give you a quick uh, or an, an introduction into what I did during my internship in those three areas. Um, and you know, it will be an example of what, for example, your internship at Spaceship might look like. So first up, uh, my main project. I'm a computer scientist, so uh, I had the opportunity to work on a project in that area. And in this case, it is Internet of Things for Lunar Exploration. And the entire project is based on the, a concept that we call sensor confetti, which basically means environmental sensors that are uh, scattered on the lunar surface and that sort of transmit data to a central point where we can then read it and, and process it. Um, and we are trying to do all of this with commercial off-the-shelf technology, which actually means that uh, the technology that we use, you could buy it off of every, uh, every website. Uh, or not every website, but yeah. Um, yeah, and, and we're trying to do that uh, in order to provide a sort of cheap way of, of doing it. And that is so that uh, these sensors can be, uh, for example, thrown into a deep crater on the moon um, or into a, a permanently shadowed region that um, humans with bulky spacesuits maybe don't want to go into or fragile rovers possibly uh, cannot go into. So they would be more or less disposable but still transmit scientific data all the, way while, uh, all the time while being there. So yeah, the idea is that um, the sensor data is then sent via LoRa, which is a wireless um, transmission technology, it's short for long range. Um, and it's a technology just like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, but it enables you to uh, send data actually over quite a long distance, you know, over 20, 50 kilometers, which is what you need on the moon. Um, and that's why we used it. And, and it sends the data to uh, all of the other devices, basically, like itself. Um, and then it forms this sort of mesh that you can also see on the on the screen right now. Um, and the yeah the data is sent until it actually reaches a so-called gateway device, which is connected to a computer from which we can then read the data. Now uh, I'm not the first intern to work on this. Uh, the first intern to work on it was actually uh, Jan Zünkler. Uh, he's a previous intern. He also worked on it for for six months. 
and his implementation of the uh, sensor device can be seen in the in the left image here. And if you look at uh, that image on the very right of it, you'll see an accelerometer, sort of in, in blue here. To the left of that, you'll see the uh, antenna, which is professionally mounted, of course, with a rubber band. And then to the left of that, you will uh, you see the um, the Arduino-based uh, CPU, the, the computing unit, basically. Um, yeah, and then on the right hand side, uh, on, on the right picture, sorry, you'll see the uh, data display in the software where all, all of the uh, data is collected. And all of the, those four images are, um, are different data points over time. So um, yeah, it's, it's a nice overview. And all of this software actually runs on a, on a Raspberry Pi. And basically at this point in, in time, uh, Jan left the team and, and because he came to the end of his stint and then I took over the project and um, yeah, the implementation that, that Jan had uh, was already very nice. So I focused mainly on simplification and on miniaturization. Uh, what I did was I reworked the uh, LoRa network protocol because we had to write that completely ourselves. And I, I reworked it uh, and I implemented a different system to store and display all of the data that can be seen in the bottom right here. Uh, it now uses uh, uh, an open source mission control software by NASA. It is called OpenMCT. And it's quite nice once you get it to work. Before that, it is not very nice, but afterwards it is. Um, yeah, I also completely uh, reworked how the sensors are basically implemented and added a lot of new data points. For example, we now support uh, magnetic field vectors and temperature while still using uh, commercial off-the-shelf hardware. So that's very exciting. Then in terms of um, miniaturization, I removed the large uh, solderless breadboard that you were able, able to see in the, in the previous frame. And I put all of the electrical elements on a smaller protoboard, which you can see in, in green here. Um, and then for this new setup, I made a case in CAD, which is uh, by now actually 3D printed. And that was especially interesting for me because uh, before that point, I had never worked with uh, 3D printed material or with CAD software even. So uh, yeah, and then that's part of the beauty of Spaceship EAC is that uh, I could just ask many of my spaceship colleagues if uh, if I didn't know how to implement a feature. For example, with this specific, uh, um, with the case specifically, I worked together with uh, Timon very closely. So um, yeah, and now uh, it's pretty much the, the, the end of my internship. The end result is a product that is already uh, pretty small. The software is already written. And in general, I think the project is ready to be uh, pursued further, either by another intern in the future or maybe by uh, an organization or something. And then maybe one day it will actually find its way to the moon, which would be very exciting. Now, uh, yeah, in, in terms of uh, contribution to other projects, uh, I was actually able to uh, participate in quite a lot of other interns' uh, projects. Uh, if it was you know, testing specific features or maybe implementing of a specific feature or every now and then just idea finding. Um, I want to highlight this one specific project uh, by a colleague of mine. She is uh, designing a, uh, a display for a moon rock that was collected by Apollo 16. And uh, a sketch of the display you can see in the uh, bottom left here. That one uh, will actually be located in the entrance hall of the European Astronaut Center. And um, yeah, it will feature a sort of interactive display with information about um, the rock and the mission and also about uh, the European Astronaut Center. And one of those pages uh, you can see in the bottom right here um, about the neutral uh, buoyancy facility. And what I did for the project was I worked on uh, the software that basically enables all of the interactivity and also the translations and, and all of that. Um, yeah, so it was a very collaborative thing. It was a constant back and forth with her and uh, very, very uh, exciting to work on it. Uh, and then what will be even more exciting will be to see it one day uh, at EAC, you know, standing there in the in the entrance hall. And if you ever get to visit EAC and you'll find the display, you will, you know, know how part of it was, was made. Um, yeah, and then uh, as a last project that I want to show you today, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, one of our uh, one of our colleagues found this uh, public call for ideas on ESA's website, and um, we decided that we wanted to uh, take part in that. You know, in the beginning, it was supposed to be more or less in our own terms, but then uh, over time, the more we talked to more spaceship people, and when everybody was excited about it, uh, we were actually able to work on it during our regular work time. 
Um, and it was uh, purely work done by interns. So the idea came from an intern and the project leader more or less was an intern and everybody involved was an intern. And it was a, a, a uniquely creative process, uh, the, the entire thing. Um, so um, yeah, we did everything from brainstorming to to find the ideas, uh, to you know design sprints to work out the, the the details, and then all the way to actually writing the deliverable. And uh, this call for ideas was about uh, ESA's ER three lander, which is an unmanned lander that is scheduled to fly to the moon and land on the moon by uh, twenty twenty seven. And uh, what they the, basically the question that they asked was what sort of payload would you send to the moon if you had the chance? And what we came up with was this um, idea about uh, a, a rover that, um, uh, yeah, a rover design that can ca uh, basically carry standardized rover, uh, sorry, standardized customer payload, um, almost like uh, the CubeSat concept, you know? Uh, and the rover will provide uh, all of the systems like navigation and communication and so on. And the customers can then simply focus on actually getting their payload onto the rover. And the customer payload is, is uh, displayed here with the blue cubes. Um, and then the customer, they wouldn't have to focus on uh, engineering a rover from ground up, but they could simply focus on you know, getting their payloads. Um, yeah, in, in general, in, in a nutshell, I suppose that was uh, five or six months uh, as, an, as an intern at Spaceship EAC. Um, so far, it was a very nice, uh, very nice time. I learned a lot, uh, and I'm sure that I will continue to learn a lot for the last uh, two, three weeks that I'm here. Uh, and for now, I will um, hand it back to Timon, who will now tell you something about life as a trainee. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, so yeah, I'm now basically going to do the same thing and you're going to be stuck with me for the rest of this presentation. And I'm going to be talking about uh, my traineeship. Uh, so first of all, uh, what is a trainee? So uh, at ESA trainees uh, are young professionals. So people who just graduated with a master's degree uh, who are uh, taking a uh, uh, a mission of one uh, to two years uh, at an ESA site within an ESA team and work more or less as an ESA employee would. Uh, I, for myself, I'm a Swiss national trainee, uh, which means that I'm actually employed by the Swiss Space Center, uh, which then sends me on this one to two years mission uh, at ESA. In my case, that was at EAC uh, working for a spaceship. So here are a few things about myself. So I'm 24 years old. I'm both a Swiss and French national. And as I already said, I'm working as a Swiss national trainee for Spaceship EAC. Uh, I actually joined Spaceship uh, on the 1st of December, 2019. So I've been here for eight months now, uh, and I've been working on a variety of different projects, uh, including the ones listed here. So uh, looking on the technical side, looking at how we can use microwaves uh, to process lunar regolith. Uh, then I also took a more uh, coordinating role uh, for the uh, advanced manufacturing team in general. Uh, and then I'm also talk taking care of the 3D printing service that I'm going to talk a bit more about later. And finally, I took part in the Venus Rover Challenge, which is a, an interesting group project that we had over the last months. But to start with, I'd like to talk a bit about my background. So as you can see here, I'm a mechanical and manufacturing engineer. Uh, and this all started in 2013. Uh, when I joined uh, the INSA de Lyon, an engineering school uh, in France, where I did my foundation course, as well as my uh, mechanical engineering uh, or my first year of mechanical engineering. In 2016, I got the opportunity uh, to join uh, Trinity College Dublin to continue my studies there in Ireland, uh, where I graduated uh, from with, uh, with my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. And this is also where I wrote my master's thesis on uh, building an attitude control uh, testbed uh, for a CubeSat, which is a small kind of satellite. And this is actually only at the master's thesis is when I got involved uh, with space related activities, uh, especially uh, since I got the opportunity to present my master's work uh, at a conference organized by ESA for students called the Symposium on Space Educational Activities. Uh, so this is where I, I got my uh, I got the first shot at, at, at meeting the European space community uh, and working on space related topics. To finish off my studies, I returned to INSA for one year, 
uh, where I uh, uh, finished my master's degree and where I also did a six month internship in that case at Volvo. So not in the space sector. Uh, and this again shows that uh, uh, at ESA in general and uh, at Spaceship EAC uh, specifically, uh, we not only looking for people who did uh, aerospace engineering from the get-go, uh, but also for a, a whole variety of, of the different backgrounds. I mean, uh, as Sebastian showed, we even have a, a young pilot in our ranks. Uh, so a lot of doors, uh, or our door is open to a, to a lot of different people. Um, then uh, well, from there, I graduated, so or I finished my studies in at the end of July, uh, and I went uh, to apply to the uh, national trainee program with the Swiss Space Center, uh, and I got my reply there uh, by, by the end of August uh, from last year, uh, telling me that I will be in fact joining the program uh, and start working at Spaceship uh, in December. So uh, in those last uh, eight months now, I've been uh, working uh, in the following areas. Uh, so on the top and left-hand side, you can see obviously technical research work, uh, uh, spaceship group project and DAC activities, which are, uh, I would say the more R&D parts of our work and also the parts that are similar to what uh, an intern would actually do at Spaceship as Sebastian already explained. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you can see team coordination and spaceship administration. Uh, as a trainee, you are part of the management team of spaceship uh, and you, you get to uh, uh, lead uh, a team of, uh, of students. Uh, and you also uh, are part of the administrative processes such as the procurements for the team uh, or also uh, the recruitment of, of, uh, of new people. Uh, so I'm now going to uh, give you uh, a bit of an overview of what I did in those different fields uh, during my time here uh, to uh, yeah, give you uh, an idea of what you may be doing if, if you decide to join us as a trainee. So first and uh, foremost, there's still, of course, the technical work, which is at the heart of the traineeship. Uh, and I have two examples here, although I'm working on uh, a few projects in parallel. Those are uh, perhaps the two uh, standout examples and the most uh, easy, I would say, to, to encompass in, in that presentation. Uh, the first one being the refurbishment of an experimental 3D printing setup that we had in our lab. So this was uh, some work done previously by another member of Spaceship uh, and that uh, I basically came into and had to complete. Uh, so start, starting uh, with an already quite advanced design and then finalizing it to and now have uh, a functioning uh, experimental setup. This is uh, the, uh, the um, uh, structure you can see on the left there. Um, and um, on, on that side, uh, which was, uh, it was a very good way for me to enter Spaceship since it allowed me to work in my field of expertise, which is mechanical engineering uh, and, and to find my footing there. So it's always uh, very nice and, and yeah, reassuring in a bit to, to be uh, working on, on stuff you already know. On the other hand, I've, I've also been working uh, on microwaves, which is a field I didn't know much about. So uh, we are currently investigating uh, microwaves uh, as a way of processing uh, regolith. So to heat it up, either uh, in order to sinter it uh, and to make structures out of it, uh, or just to uh, extract some volatiles out of it, such as oxygen. Uh, so I did some, uh, obviously, a lot of reading on that topic to familiarize myself with it, and then some experimental work, and finally, during lockdown, also some more theoretical uh, simulation work. Uh, and that shows uh, that, so Spaceship gave me uh, a great opportunity, in a way, to uh, address a completely new te technical area uh, that, that I had, had only very little experience with, uh, and I, I got the chance to get fully involved in that and to dive uh, deep in, into a new, a new technical subject, which is always, of course, very interesting. Moving on now to the uh, less uh, technical stuff, uh, a major part of my work as well as Spaceship is the team coordination aspect. Uh, so I am part of the advanced manufacturing team together with two students, uh, Benoit and Billy, uh, and I am uh, actually uh, coordinating this team. So I'm the person of contact for those students, uh, and I have the role of, of uh, supervising their projects and, and supporting them if needed. 
since uh, as a trainee, I'm present longer than most of our students. Uh, I'm also in charge of the on and offboarding uh, of the students to allow some continu con continuity uh, in our different projects. So obviously, uh, the students that we have at, at Spaceship EAC uh, are, um, are, are, mo are mostly brilliant and very autonomous. So uh, there isn't much work to do in terms of, uh, of managing and coordinating them, but it's still a very uh, good experience for myself uh, to, uh, to discover uh, the, the world of, of team management uh, and project planning, uh, which I didn't have a lot of experience uh, of before. So a great opportunity for me on that side. Um, similarly, uh, we, I've also taken part in group projects, the main one being the Venus Rover Challenge. Uh, so the story behind that is that was, again, uh, an open call for proposals, uh, in this case from NASA, uh, who opened this call uh, since they wanted the uh, general public to uh, think about and to design an obstacle avoidance system uh, for a rover they want to send on Venus. Uh, the tricky part being that this system had to be fully mechanical. Uh, so obviously, as a mechanical engineer, I had to jump on this opportunity. Uh, and together with other people from Spaceship, uh, we, we, we founded a team of around 10 people and started brainstorming our way uh, at this uh, challenge, uh, ending up with uh, the proposals that you can see here. Um, we actually did, uh, did get the results last week and we got the honorable mentions on that. So it's always very nice uh, to get some, uh, some feedback, some recognition of your work and also to contribute to, to the, um, uh, to, to, to making spa spaceship more, more visible to the outside. Uh, on that specific uh, project, uh, I've taken on uh, obviously some of the technical work, but I've also been the main uh, project coordinator and, uh, and project manager, uh, which, me which means that I, again, could learn a lot on uh, team management and project planning. Uh, so uh, he here again, a uh, very, very interesting way to, to learn new, new skills and not only in the technical domain. Uh, the last point I wanted to address would be uh, EAC activities. So as we already mentioned a, a couple of times, Spaceship EAC uh, is definitely part of EAC. It is in the name. Um, and uh, one of the things I do uh, in contact with EAC is managing the 3D, ser 3D printing service that we have there. So we have our 3D printers that we use for our research on additive manufacturing. Um, and once when they're not used for that purpose, uh, we actually are in contact with the rest of, uh, of the EAC employees who can access them through us if they wish to produce some component. For instance, if someone needs a purpose-built hardware or a small replacement part for training activities, they can reach out to us and we can find a way to manufacture it. Uh, on the image you can see here was uh, one of uh, the very good applications that we had for that service was actually uh, to print uh, face shields uh, during lockdown. So for that were then delivered to hospitals and other medical institutions. Uh, and that was obviously a very rewarding task to do. And also um, very, uh, I'm also very grateful for, uh, first of all, Spaceship, but also EAC in general for letting us use those resources uh, in that way to contribute to, to pandemic uh, mitigation. Uh, and uh, when you're not in the scenario of, uh, of a global pandemic, uh, those EAC activities are obviously a very good way to get to know uh, people from outside spaceship uh, who have uh, all a lot of uh, experience to share and you can definitely learn a lot from them. So this is more or less it uh, for the overview uh, of uh, my traineeship and what you can expect, uh, uh, you could expect uh, as a trainee uh, when joining spaceship. So I'm now, going to start concluding this presentation uh, by uh, summarizing uh, why you should join Spaceship EAC uh, from the different points raised by Sebastian and myself. So uh, first point here, I think we both agree with Sebastian is that uh, Spaceship EAC is a very uh, positive environment to work in and very uh, open to everyone and, and, and dynamic. Uh, and since we have a lot of uh, young members, there's always something interesting going on either at work or outside of work. Uh, 
there is a great diversity in people. Uh, a lot of different backgrounds are represented. And also the technical projects, as we have already seen, are very varied. Uh, and you, you will get the opportunity uh, to learn uh, new skills, be it technical or non-technical. Uh, in my case, on the technical side, that would have been uh, microwave engineering, which I'm still in the process of, of diving into and understanding. Uh, and Sebastian, for instance, also gave the example of uh, CAD design, which you get involved with uh, for the first time and learn how to do. You also get uh, a lot of freedom and responsibilities in organizing your project work. Um, obviously, uh, for uh, trainees, since we're part of, of the management team of Spaceship, uh, but also for interns. I mean, the perfect example of that is the Cream Rover project that, that Sebastian mentioned, um, uh, which was entirely led by students. They came up with the idea, uh, they implemented it, they submitted it, and they did a very good job with it. And we at Spaceship are, of course, very happy uh, to welcome uh, and encourage those uh, initiatives. Uh, then uh, you're not just working at Spaceship EAC, you're also working at EAC in general. Uh, so uh, you will get the opportunity to meet and work with a whole lot of interested and much more experienced people there. Uh, so uh, compared to us as students and young professionals, those are veterans of uh, hu human spaceflight uh, and, space, uh, and the space domain in general. And there's always a lot to learn. Uh, and, and they're all very, very open in, 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 in sharing their, their experience, either uh, during uh, common projects or be it uh, over a coffee or, or during lunch. A bit more specific to the trainee role, uh, I actually get uh, uh, access to an individualized mentorship program through Space, Spaceship EAC. Uh, so I have an ESA staff that is my mentor uh, from outside of Spaceship and that I can be, uh, a, a, that I have a privileged contact with and that uh, gives me some feedback, some advice on, on how, to, how to best do my work and also provides me with a, an outside perspective, uh, a perspective from outside of Spaceship EAC. Uh, and finally, uh, we're all part of ESA. Uh, so we get uh, access to, to some of the resources there. Uh, interns and trainees both can attend uh, public talks or rec lectures. Uh, that are given uh, on site or uh, currently uh, through uh, video conferencing. Uh, <clears throat> for trainees, uh, we can actually we can actually as access uh, some more resources such as uh, online courses and training courses aimed at uh, e at ESA uh, staff, uh, which is obviously uh, very interesting and can can help uh, de develop your profile even further. So uh, now that I've convinced all of you that you should try to join Spaceship EAC, uh, I'm going to conclude the presentation by uh, telling you how you can join, how you could have the opportunity to join us. So there are a few different options. The first would be the Young Graduate Program, uh, open to all, uh, to everyone from a, an ESA member state uh, with, uh, with a master's degree. And uh, we publish those opportunities every, uh, every year uh, on November. So definitely keep an eye open for that. Uh, those positions are all across ESA. And uh, at Spaceship, we're always looking at getting at least one uh, young graduate trainee on board. Then we have student internships. Uh, uh, we at Spaceship obviously uh, uh, rely a lot on that. And, and we will publish some, uh, some new offers at the end of the year, uh, probably uh, as soon as September. So definitely keep an eye, an eye open. Those will all be on the ESA career portal and open to, to students from, from all, all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, there are also, uh, of course, other internships elsewhere at ESA. So definitely go have a browse, a browse there. And then the final uh, way of entering, which is the way, the way I choose, is national trainee program. So through the different national agencies, which you have to uh, contact directly. In my case, it was through the Swiss Space Center and through their website where uh, those uh, call for applications were, were posted. Uh, but uh, there are also other agencies doing similar pro uh, programs uh, in Belgium, uh, Germany, Portugal, Ireland, Luxembourg, and Estonia. So I definitely hope uh, that uh, you will, uh, if you have the opportunity, uh, give this a try. 
and I'm definitely looking forward to perhaps meeting some of you in the very near future. That concludes this presentation. Uh, thank you very much for attending. I hope you found it somewhat interesting. Uh, and I'm now going to take a few questions from uh, Jesus. Thank you very much, uh, Timon. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for this really nice presentation. It's been really nice to know more about your background uh, with your experience in the European Space Agency. And as Timon said, the, although the European Astronaut Center might be not as known as other places of the European Space Agency, you really have very impressive programs over there. So it's been really nice to know more about them. Um, we don't have too much time for questions. We just have 10 minutes. So now I, I will ask you, Timon and Sebastian, to just give a short overview of the answer so we can address as much questions as possible from the public. Um, I have divided the questions into two domains. We have some more technical ones and another ones related to the career at ISA. So I will start with the more technical ones. And the first one that uh, came from the public is related to the astronaut training, because we saw at the very beginning that you have the astronauts and this kind of a space talks uh, underwater. Um, but they, the public is interested in knowing how realistic these underwater uh, walks are related to what exactly they do in space. Do you think it's a realistic approach? And over, moreover, if there are more uh, characteristics that you actually replicate when the astronauts are going underwater, for example, if they test radiation, temperature difference, how is the actual training of the astronauts? Uh, yeah, very interesting question there. So that's uh, not completely my, my field of expertise, but I'm going to try to do the best at answering those. Uh, so yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, Training in the water is the easiest and the best we can do, uh, I think, to, to replicate uh, zero-G conditions. There are other alternatives. Uh, our astronauts also do parabolic flights, which are uh, closer uh, to what they would experience in actual weightlessness. Uh, but uh, also, on the downside, uh, you can spend less time there. The main advantage of uh, neutral buoyancy uh, training is that uh, you can have uh, fully emerged replicas of, of uh, as you saw at the beginning of this presentation, for instance, the Columbus module. Uh, so it, it's still uh, it's still used a lot, uh, especially for uh, training for for EVAs, so extravehicular uh, activities. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And now that you mentioned uh, the technology that you are developing there, is there any of the devices that you've been uh, doing at the European Astronaut Center actually in space? Are they in the, for example, in the International Space Station, or are they still in the TRL on the Earth level? Um, that's an interesting question. We are actually uh, currently, so over the last weeks, uh, we've been uh, looking into getting some of our proposals uh, into uh, the ISS, so into uh, so trying to propose some experiments, uh, not uh, fully developed systems, but some experiments that we did on the ground and that we think would be very uh, interesting to do uh, in space. Uh, an example I can give there is on radiation shielding. Uh, we have that regolith simulant that, that we use uh, uh, for our experiments on the ground, and we would like to take some of that uh, on the ISS to uh, verify their properties uh, up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm, absolutely, and now you talk about all these experiments, I think is really encouraging for the, for the people to develop these ideas on the earth level and then increase the technology level by uh, performing, for example, a parabolic flight in order to simulate or directly into the space. Uh, for example, um, Sebastian, you were developing the cream rover. And uh, I would like to know about the specifications about your idea, because you said it was uh, flexible that people can put their payloads inside. What kind of space will be available in the rover? Which kind of payloads are you targeting with? Because the payloads, of course, depends on the customer and the customer has different shapes and different technologies inside. What kind of payloads can you put inside the rover actually? Yeah, that is a, that is a very good question. So um, uh, we try to be as open as possible with uh, what sort of payloads you uh, you would be able to put on the rover. So uh, on, on one hand, you would have the sort of smaller uh, cube set type uh, standardized systems, but we also have uh, a standardized space that people can uh, put their uh, robotic payloads on, you know, when it comes to, for example, uh, sample return. 
uh, missions or maybe a robotic arm, we also have a place uh, on the rover where we could interface that uh, onto. So um, yeah, this it is a very varied uh, rover, and we always try to be as open as possible with our um, yeah with, with with our design. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Was the idea finally selected or in which kind of uh, process as you right now? Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, we only submitted it, I think, about uh, two weeks ago uh, or three weeks ago, something like that. Uh, so it's in, in the process of being judged and everything. Um, so we will know in a couple of weeks or months. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, good luck uh, with your idea. Uh, now I would like to focus a little bit more on your careers. Uh, we saw that you both have different uh, backgrounds. Uh, Sebastian, for example, was studying astrophysics, uh, then he was training as a pilot. Um, so in this area over here, I would like to know what are your next steps uh, in your professional development. Uh, first, Timon, you could ask, and then Sebastian uh, might take the lead of it afterwards. Okay, uh, well, that is a very interesting question. I'd be interesting to I'd be interested in the answer to that as well. Uh, so on my side, in the near future, of course, it would, would be the renewal of uh, of the one-year uh, traineeship contract, uh, which I hope uh, we will succeed. So I should be here for at least uh, one more year. Uh, and then uh, what one uh, path I would consider for myself maybe would be uh, going into, uh, so staying into the technical R&D uh, part, uh, either in the industry or perhaps even uh, going down the road of, of a PhD thesis, uh, if I find, of course, uh, an interesting topic somewhere. That is, uh, that is very interesting. And uh, from, from my side, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's the million dollar question, right? What's going to happen in the future? Uh, it, especially now with the uh, uncertain times that we currently have. Um, you, you mentioned it earlier, uh, Jesus, uh, I did the, the pilot's training. Uh, it's sort of on ice, everything uh, when it comes to aviation. So uh, I'm I'm actually very glad that I ended up uh, more or less by accident in space exploration, and uh, yeah, I, I'm uh, for now going to uh, finish up my internship, and I already have a, another job uh, in in space exploration uh, lined up more or less, which is very exciting. And I will definitely, you know, I, I definitely want to to learn more about the field, about space, and about um, everything. So um, yeah, it's. Uh, Definitely interesting times ahead, but also uncertain times. But it's the same for all of us. Yes, absolutely. This is something everybody is facing. <laughs> and uh, I would like to know more because right now you are working for the Aerospace Space Agency. But uh, is it possible to continue in this experience or the people that are joining are in a fixed term and that they will, ha they will have to find something uh, else uh, where, for example, in another company or you can actually uh, be in the Aerospace uh, Space Agency for two or three years more if you want? Um, uh, so, yeah, go ahead, Timon. I, I'm going to take that one, perhaps. So, um, on on the ESA side, so the trainee program is is definitely uh, limited in time, so it's two year maximum. Uh, and after that, uh, well, you can apply directly uh, to uh, an ESA staff position. Although uh, traditionally th those are are mostly open to more experienced people, but there are still ways to to keep in to stay involved. Uh, PhD is actually a good one. Uh, there are so, some funds uh, or some funded PhD programs uh, fr from ESA. Uh, and uh, also there are a lot of people who are working for contractors uh, as, a, as a way of, of getting into ESA and then evolving into a ESA, ESA employee and ESA, ESA staff uh, positions. Uh, in any case, something that's uh, often Often brought up is that uh, in the coming 10 years, ESA will face a, a huge wave of retirements. Uh, so there should, there will definitely be a lot of renewal of people, uh, and there will be a, a, a lot of uh, new opportunities, I guess, uh, to to join the European Space Agency. Absolutely, uh, thank you very much, Timon. And uh, we really share your passion for space, uh, and also with you, Sebastian, because it's been really nice to know more about what you've been doing. And I had a lot of people in the comments actually be really inspiring and willing to join you in your adventure at the European Astronaut Center. Uh, we don't have uh, too much time now. Uh, I know we, I do. We have more questions from the audience, including if you guys are single or not. But I guess we can leave your email in the description for this kind of professional and not professional questions for the rest. Uh, I would like to thank you very much, uh, all the audience, for watching. And I will see you tomorrow with another um, project show. Bye bye.